Nobel laureate and NC State alumnus, Dr. Rajendra K. Pachori, has been the chief executive of the Energy and Resources Institute since 1982, serving initially as director and since April 2001 as director general. He also serves as chancellor of TERI University. A noted climate scientist, Dr. Pachori has been active in several international forums dealing with climate change and its policy dimensions. In April 2002, he was elected as chairman of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, which was established by the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program. In 2007, Dr. Pachori and his IPCC colleagues, along with former Vice President Al Gore, were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. His wide-ranging expertise has resulted in his membership on several international and national boards and committees, including the Economic Advisory Council to India's Prime Minister, the Advisory Board on Energy, which reported directly to India's Prime Minister, the Advisory Board for the Clinton Climate Initiative, the International Advisory Board for Toyota Motor Corporation, and several others. In 2009, he was appointed the first director of the Yale Climate and Energy Institute. He's also on the board of the Global Humanitarian Forum, founded by the former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. In April 1999, he was appointed member of the Board of Directors of the Institute of Global Environmental Strategies in Japan and continues to hold this appointment. Since 1992, he has been president of the Asian Energy Institute. He was president in 1988 and chairman from 1989 to 90 of the International Association for Energy Economics. Among his many honors, in 2008, he was honored by the President of India with the Padma Vibhushan, India's second highest civilian award for his services in the field of science and engineering. Pachori was awarded the Officier de la Légion d'Honneur by the Government of France in 2006. He also received the Padma Bhushan from the President of India in 2001 for his immense contributions to environmental studies. Dr. Pachori has an MS and PhD in industrial engineering as well as economics, all from NC State University. He also served as an assistant professor and visiting professor at NC State in the mid-1970s. Dr. Pachori, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Sciences Honoris Causa. Congratulations. Dr. Pachuri, you honor us with your presence today, and we look forward to your remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Pachari. Chancellor W. Randolph Woodson, Chair of the Board of Trustees, Ms. Barbara Mulkey, Mr. David Powers, members of the Board of Trustees, members of the faculty, <clears throat> assembled students, humanities, hope for the future. May I say I'm deeply honored and touched at this privilege which is being bestowed on me today, has been bestowed on me today. There's nothing greater, nothing more glorifying than coming home and being honored. This is my alma mater. I owe a huge debt of gratitude to this institution. And it's indeed a 
an enormous privilege to stand here before you and to receive this honor today. I would like to compliment the leadership, the faculty, and the students of this university for the enormous growth and development that has taken place in this remarkable institution. I would like to recall in particular a great service that was performed by this faculty in converting me into an engineer economist from an industrial engineer. There are so many members of the faculty that I owe a great deal to, but I want to bring out the name of one single individual, Professor Tom Grenis. In my very first semester, as a candidate for the master's degree in industrial engineering, I took economics as my minor field. And I enrolled for a class, EC401, which was economics for non-majors. And that really sparked my interest in this entire field of economics. And I said to myself, I have obviously been missing something that is my true avocation in life. And I recall, for the first time, I ran into the concept of the externalities that economic activities impose on the environment and on society. We had a thin little book, very interesting, very readable, called Tan Staffel. Now that stood as an acronym for the name, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And it was by Edwin Nolan. And I can't get this out of my mind because that really brought home to me the importance of looking at the economy in its widest context. You cannot look at economic activities purely in the sense of production and consumption decisions. You must close the loop and find out how we are impacting on Spaceship Earth by pursuing what we regard as very narrow and perhaps very focused activities. I want to mention something that Chancellor Wood Woodson has said, NC State is proud to be the people's university. It indeed is. And I'm sure when he talks about this being a people's university, he's talking about the people of the world. I think it is in that context that Chairperson Barbara Mulkey also referred to NCSU conducting groundbreaking research and, slow and solving global challenges. When I had the privilege of accepting, accepting the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the IPCC. I used an expression which comes from India, an ancient Sanskrit expression called Vasudev Kutumbukam, which means the universe is one family. And therefore, when we are talking about the people of the world, we must take into account the people of the world as a whole. I'm really privileged to share this occasion with two outstanding human beings, Dr. Buchanan and Mr. Stanton. And what Mr. Buchanan is doing is really path-breaking. Uh, I'd like to quote Mahatma Gandhi, one of the greatest human beings that's ever walked the face of this earth. When he was asked, what should we do about poverty in the world? His response was, Recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him. Dr. Buchanan is doing that in all his actions day in and day out. As far as Mr. Stanton is concerned, a great conservationist, a great one for preserving the beauty, the wealth of nature. Again, Gandhi was once asked, what do you think of wildlife? And his response was, well, wildlife is decreasing in the jungles, but wildlife is growing in the cities. Now here, I'd like to say that the problem of climate change, which we are facing on an increasing extent, has implications for the work of these two outstanding leaders as well. We had concluded in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC that warming of the climate system is unequivocal. In other words, it's beyond doubt. We also stated that most of the warming that has taken place since the middle of the last century was very likely on account of increase 
in the concentration of anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Now, when we use the term, very likely it means a probability of more than 90%. So that's something that human society has to take into account and do something serious to, to address. Recently, we brought out a special report on extreme events and disasters and how we might enhance adaptation to these extreme events. And we said very clearly, and I quote, extreme events will have greater impacts on sectors with closer links to climate, such as water, agriculture, and food security, forestry, health, and tourism. So the climate of this planet, which we are affecting indelibly, is going to have major impacts on all these sectors, which are the core of human existence. We also came up with the finding that those heat waves, which are taking place now in once in 20 years, if we don't do anything about this problem, will become events that occur once in two years in this century. We also said that the frequency of heavy precipitation events is going up. And that has major implications for people, safety, for property, and, it's, uh, and, and the problems that we're likely to face as a result of damage that would take place. Also, increased extreme coastal high water would occur as a result of increase in the mean sea level. Now, what I want to highlight is also the fact that if the temperature of this planet was to increase on average beyond 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius, then 20 to 30 percent of the species that we have assessed would be facing the threat of extinction. This is something that human society can only do through a continued action of folly in the activities that we pursue. Now, what should we do about it? Well, we have to reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases if we want to stabilize the climate of this planet. One major policy that we find would be extremely important is to place a price on carbon. We have carried out a detailed study of renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation, and we brought out a special report on this early this year. And we found that by 2050, depending on the policies that we put in place, the scenarios that we can develop trying to quantify and assess the future, we could have renewable energy provide 11 to 77 percent of the total energy that's going to be used by human society. Now, this gives us the range of the opportunities that exist. The question is, what is it that we are willing to seize and implement through the vision that we must be driven by in cognizance of what's likely to happen if we don't take action? I was in Durban a few weeks ago, and I was delighted to hear President Zuma say that our level of ambition should meet the demands of science. And I think that level of our ambition has to be articulated by the young people who are present over here. I also want to mention there are some parts of the world that we must pay special attention to. Africa in particular is very vulnerable. We have found it is by far one of the most vulnerable regions in the world. For instance, as early as 2020, we could have two, 75 to 250 million people living in a state of water stress as a result of climate change. Again, as early as 2020, some countries in Africa could see a decline in agricultural productivity of up to 50% on account of climate change and climate variability. So what we really need to do is to develop technologies. And this is a challenge for the engineers, the scientists who are present over here. We need to put in place policies, and this can only happen if we educate the public, if we make sure that there's a democratic upsurge of desire to do something that would also motivate the leaders across the world to do what is essential. We need to bring about some changes in lifestyles not necessarily by giving up the comforts that we are accustomed to, but certainly by cutting out waste, being a little more conscious, as I said, of the fact that there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. 
And the reality is that the actions required to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases carry a huge amount of core benefits. One of the core benefits, let's say we were to improve our efficiency of energy use and go in for much greater use of renewable energy, one core benefit would be higher levels of energy security. We will also possibly be able to generate many more new jobs. There is a great deal of emphasis today and attention being provided to a green economy. There could be enormous benefits associated with it. There would be co-benefits in the nature of higher agricultural productivity and a whole range of others. So my submission to this generation that's going to really change the world is that please take these scientific realities into account in fashioning your careers and laying down the agenda that you're going to pursue in your profession. And what I would say is that Nelson Mandela was absolutely right when he said, and I quote, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So, young friends, go out into the world and use this weapon of peace for changing the world for a brighter future. Shed your light of knowledge on those who are underprivileged and use your education for creating a society which is fair, equitable, caring, and humane. And most importantly, a society that ensures sustainable growth and development. All the best to you.